Well, welcome to the Big Four. I'm your host, Brent Adams. This week, our panelists will tackle some of the pressing questions in the grain markets ahead of the August World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report, which will be released on August the 12th. Joining us this week, our Agricultural Economic Insights co-founder, award-winning podcaster, and the show's co-creator, David Widmar. Also from Farm Progress, Farm Futures Grain Market Analyst, Jacqueline Holland. And from Morrison on the Markets, it's veteran commodities trader and technical market analyst, Ken Morrison. The questions we tackle here have been posed to the AEI Forecast Network. And in a moment, David will share the consensus average of AEI subscribers' responses to the topics. But before we do, we'd love to get some feedback from our esteemed panelists. And as we mentioned in the open, the August WASD report will be released on August the 12th. And this report likely will have a sizable impact on the markets for the remainder of the year. So I want to start out talking this week about corn yields. And David, uh, we're going to throw this one to you to start out here. What is the probability of the USDA's WASD estimating U.S. corn yields above 177 eight bushels per acre? And David, you were part of the team that created these questions. What was the thought process behind these, uh, th this particular question? Well, yeah, we always think it's important to use good tools to think about uncertainty. And for most of us, uh, you know, simply guessing what the U.S. what number the USDA is going to guess isn't a good exercise. And so we need to think about the range of uncertainty. So we've been uh, thinking a lot about what the situation looks like to be evolved. Some of the models we do within AEI are saying somewhere around this 177 ballpark, 177 bushels per acre is below where the USDA started at 179.5 bushels. And so we thought 177 was a good starting point. You know, I my bias here, I'll share my expectations. My forecast is a 70% chance of it being above that. Now, I will tell you, I'm probably going to change my forecast by the time I listen to Ken and, and Jacqueline on this. But the AFN consensus or the average of all the, uh, the members in our network who've been forecasting this, they're coming in at a 38% probability. So I know I'm way out here on the limb of the USDA, um, you know, having a yield uh, equal to or above 177 here. So uh, this is where we kicked it off. And so it's interesting to see everyone else's expectations here. Well, Jacqueline, I'll open this up to you. Where do you fall on that spectrum? So my group at Farm Futures just finished up a producer survey. We do one three times a year. Um, and one of the three that we do is always timed ahead of the August WASD so that we can get a first look at producer expectations of some of those yields. Um, and what we saw in our latest survey um, was that farmers are expecting to yield an average of 178.7 um, bushels per acre this year. Uh, and driving through, as I've kind of driven across the Midwest this summer, you know, there's a lot of spots in the, particularly the Eastern Corn Belt, where crops look very, where they look very good. Um, but this is still a little bit lower than USDA's current estimate of 179.5 bushels per acre. So that definitely opens the door to some stock tightening down the road. Um, especially with export demand being as high as it has been in the 2021 20, uh, marketing year. Um, so with that, we're forecasting ending stocks to end at 137 billion bushels this year, uh, which would put the stocks to use ratio at 9.2. Uh, and that's going to be the eighth tightest crop on record. And so you've heard a couple of opinions here now, Ken, uh, where, where do you fall on things? Well, in terms of yields, uh, I think David made a good point. Uh, I, I think it's a futile exercise to try to outguess what USDA is going to do. Uh, so I approach it from a combination of looking at uh, crop conditions, which admittedly are not uh, the total picture, but uh, they are they are some guide, and I think they've been some guide to USDA. Uh, I'm, USDA has started out above trend yield. Trend yield is about 178.4 on a long-term basis. Uh, so I'm using 178.4. Uh, USDA has begun, and in their July forecast, used 179.5. So I'm about a bushel and a half an acre 
uh, below uh, where USDA was in July. Uh, I still think that, you know, to say that this year is a year when there is wide variation from state to state and from even areas to areas within states uh, is an understatement. But uh, I think there are a lot of great areas in states like Illinois. Of course, I live here in St. Louis and I tend to be influenced, as we all do, by backyard itis. Uh, and it's been a garden spot here in eastern Illinois and, uh, and across Illinois for, mo for the most part. Uh, so I think there's enough great areas that are going to offset some of the very poor areas. Uh, so that's where I'm lining up in terms of yields. Uh, so to answer the question uh, at 178.4, I, I guess I'm giving that about a 75 percent probability of being above uh, the benchmark that was uh, asked of us. All right. Well, next, I want to move into soybean yield. And uh, the question here, what is the probability of the USDA's August WASD estimating U.S. soybean yields above 49 and a half bushels per acre? David, uh, you want to give us a crack at that one? Right. So the USDA started this at 50.5. Um, their kind of early model assumes, Ken alluded to this, but they kind of assume, you know, good weather, not a disaster out the gate. Uh, so it's always a little better than the trend. And so 49.5 would be a bushel below that. That's where some of the models that we have uh, was suggesting similar to Ken's, you know, crop conditions. So we put the mark there. Um, the consensus and my expectations are all in the ballpark, about a 50-50 chance of being over and under that. I think it's really important to sort of think back to a year ago and how things can quickly change. So we're a long ways away. So last year, the August Wazi corn yield sort of fell. They, the highest corn yield we had was last August, and then it fell from there. And so thinking about soybeans, there's even more uncertainty in August for soybeans in my mind. Uh, we've looked at some of the data in the past. Um, a lot can change for soybeans, and I think the weather is still out there. So I'm more uncertain about soybeans here in August, early August, than say corn, uh, and we'll see how that plays out in the coming months. Well, Ken, how do things stack up from where you sit there in St. Louis? Uh, I, again, I'm going to use trend yields for soybeans at 50.1. Um, I, 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 there's a reason that there is should be less certainty uh, at this time of year for soybean yields because uh, soybean yields tend to be made with August weather. So USDA's survey that went out to about 20,000 producers went out uh, around the last week of July and I think was requested back by August 1. Uh, Jack, Jacqueline mentioned that their survey, I think, was more like mid-July to early August. Uh, so there is less certainty uh, with the soybean yield relative to the final yield at this time of year. Uh, so at my 50.1, again, that's trend yield. Uh, USDA started out at 50.8 in their July forecast, slightly above trend yield. Uh, again, same comment as I made in uh, corn. I think there are a lot of great areas in soybeans, but August weather is really going to be the final determinant of where we end up in soybeans. So at 50.1, uh, I'm about a 55% probability that that's where we end up. So Jacqueline, armed with all the information that you have and have had a chance to look at, uh, where do you fall? So I, I'll confess, my our survey estimates are definitely probably going to end up on the higher end of the trade range. Uh, our producers indicated that their yields were going to average out to 51.3 bushels per acre. Um, and, and based on everything that Ken and David have said about the extreme variability across the country for crop conditions, I it just it made me very skeptical as well. Um, so I because we did our survey a little bit later than USDA's, I don't know if maybe there's some extra optimism in there from producers having had some somewhat decent rain scatterings over the last couple weeks. Um, but it, it certainly it certainly surprised me because all of the producer feedback I've been getting throughout the year has indicated that soybeans are in much worse condition than corn. 
So um, 51.3 was where we landed. I wouldn't be surprised if it comes in a little bit lower. Um, but I, I think there's still a little bit of time for this crop to be made as well. Well, now I want to move on into ending stocks and we'll start with corn. What is the probability of the January 2022 WASDE report estimating the 2021-22 corn stocks to use ratio at less than 10%? David, what do you think? Well, you know, I think 10% was the number we've been looking at and following. Uh, you know, Jacqueline mentioned, you know, somewhere in the nine was, you know, eighth tightest uh, in history. And so there's sort of this, there's a breaking point there at 10%. And we start to get in that really tight stock scenario around 10%. You can argue where the great line is, the best line is, but we felt that was a good, uh, good starting place. I believe we were um, somewhere in the seven to 8% range last year as we closed out. Uh, from the last it's always hard to keep track of the years here so it was the 2020 slash 2021 marketing year we were in the seven to eight percent soft use ratio so this would be uh 10 percent would be less tight than that last window but um my forecast and the consensus are about around the 45 percent probability of us getting uh into that range so this again is a longer question. So the first two questions we talked about was specifically for the August WASD. And, and we also designed this question to be a longer burn. So we also say, okay, this is gonna get resolved in January, 2022, after we have some quarterly stock report data, after we have some more confidence around the yield, after, and particularly for, for corn, um, we'll see how much appetite China has. Cause it was a year ago when China's appetite for corn really came into the forefront. And so I think, um, the yield part is important, but we also have to look at the usage side of this. And I think there are some big question marks out there on the usage side. So Jacqueline, what do you think about that line of thinking? I would agree that there, from what I can see from our estimates, I think there is a very high chance that we will see another year of stocks coming in below 10%. Um, I, I'm seeing so many parallels between this year and a little bit between 2012 and 2013 uh, in terms of a, a sudden burst in demand and crop shortfalls. So I think we can kind of look to that a little bit to maybe get a little bit of a better idea of where these markets are going. But ultimately, I think demand is going to be the biggest driver here. Um, no matter how many extra bushels of corn USD, USDA finds or doesn't find, uh, they're going to be spoken for. Um, ethanol is kind of has kind of plateaued over the last month, and we could see some. I kind of expect to see some lower feed and residual numbers uh, as the cattle market kind of hits the peak of that liquidation cycle. Um, but export demand out of China and also out of all of these Southeast Asian countries, I think is gonna be a really huge driver for prices as this crop is harvested. Well, Ken, I know you've had some time to mull this over. What are your thoughts? Uh, I differ a little bit in, in, in the respect that I think uh, the outcome in Brazil, both in corn and soybeans are really gonna be the final determinant of what export demand will be for the U.S. Um, in terms of where I stand right now on ending stocks to use, uh, I think there's a high probability that the corn stocks to use will come in below 10 percent. Um, I don't know if it'll be reflected in the in the January uh, report, but I think ultimately it it will be reflected, and and, th and this is why. Uh, it's quite likely that in the August report next week, USDA is going to reduce the Brazilian current crop uh, by a significant amount. Uh, and as you take away supply from Brazil, you have to lower Brazilian corn exports. Those exports, assuming demand for corn holds up globally, have to go someplace. But the globe is right it, right now. The globe is rather tight on who has exportable surplus of corn. So what I see developing here is actually my export number for 21, 22 
is about 120 million bushel larger than what USDA used in their July forecast. And as a result, my ending carryout for 21-22 uh, for corn is in round numbers, 1.3 billion bushels. Uh, that's about uh, 200 million bushel less than what USDA's July forecast was. And that gives you an ending stocks to usage of about eight and a half percent. This current year, uh, USDA's forecast uh, for the current year had it at about 7.2 percent to give you some perspective. I think it's going to end up being a little higher than that. Actually, my carry-in number is 50 million bushel higher than what uh, USDA had in the July forecast, primarily because we're going to miss their forecast for the current year corn export number. Our sales currently are going to fall short of even making what their shipment forecast is by roughly 80 million bushels. I think about uh, I think ethanol will offset about 30 million bushels of that. So net net, I'm raising the forecast for carrion and corn 50 million bushel from from USDA's July forecast. So I want to circle around now and look at soybeans. What is the probability of the January 2022 WASDE report estimating the 2021-22 soybean stocks to use ratio at less than 5%? And David, we'll throw that out to you first. Right. So again, 5%, I guess, as we were looking at some of the data was sort of a, uh, a breaking point between really tight stocks and you know, 7 or 8% would be sort of a longer term average. And we've been flirting around this 3% number for quite a while. Um, my expectations are about a 65% chance of this happening. The forecast network surprised me. It was about 48 to 50% chance of it being below that 5% mark. Again, if we're staying below 5%, that's going to continue this tight stocks narrative and these strong prices. And I think this is why we really want to focus on these stocks is how long can we sort of keep thinking about these tight stock and high commodity price environment. And Jacqueline, how do you see this shaking out? So with our estimate with higher yields, we definitely see a little bit extra wiggle room in there. Um, my projection based on our yields is 4.5%. Um, so, I mean, my my perceived probability for soybean stocks less than 5% is obviously very high. Um, I think we're still you know, after coming off of two years of crop shortfalls and just the massive influx and in global demand for soybeans as China's hog herd has recovered from African swine fever, um, I, you know, I, I think the biggest factor there is going to come into play when, when the Brazilian crop is harvested and how big it ends up being. All right, Ken, we'll throw it to you. Yeah, I'm negative on uh, export demand for soybeans next year, and here's why. Uh, it starts with the fact that Brazilian supplies are currently higher than they were a year ago. Uh, exports from Brazil look like they're going to come in lower through August than they were a year ago, which means that they basically have about uh, four to five million tons, uh, 200 to 300 300 million bushel more soybeans to sell this year than they had a year ago. And we are seeing the, the effects of that. For example, uh, soybean uh, purchases for new crop shipment are down uh, considerably to China by about 50% relative to where they stood a year ago. So we're already seeing the effects. Brazil is actually making a lot of sales to China for September and October already. So this is almost the reverse of what we saw at this time a year ago for new crop soybean shipment. The other factor, of course, is that uh, USDA is already projecting, and many others are as well, based on higher acreage in Brazil, uh, they are projecting uh, a much larger crop in Brazil for the 2022 season. Uh, so therefore, they begin to compete with U.S. beans basically from end of January forward. And so that's the way I see it shaping up. Uh, I'm reducing my uh, soybean exports for 21-22 by 100 million bushel relative to what USDA used in the, in the July forecast. Uh, and based on the production that I'm using, I'm also lowering, lowering crush a bit, both 
for the current year that'll end in August and also lowering it a little bit for 21-22. Bottom line is I see ending stocks of soybeans in 22 ending at about 240 million bushel. Uh, USDA's July forecast for uh, was 157 million bushel. So I'm uh, actually seeing uh, greater supply of soybeans uh, ending up next year than relative to this year. Well, we've given the folks at home a lot of food for thought here. And before we wrap up, we'll take one last pass through the field and gather your final thoughts about anything else on your mind as it relates to the state of agriculture and the markets. And Jacqueline, we'll start with you. Perfect. Um, you know, one of the questions that we asked our producers in our latest survey was what they expect their profits in 2022 to be relative to 2021. Um, and I was really surprised to see that 39% of our farmers expect that their profit outlook isn't going to change from year over year, which I thought was really interesting um, because we are in an era of higher inflation. Um, we've seen input costs skyrocket, and there's definitely a looming concern about interest rates going up in the future. So um, I was very, very intrigued to see that. 32% uh, did say that they expect lower profits next year. And the main driver behind that is going to be input costs. 85% uh, of the respondents who expect lower incomes next year uh, cited higher input costs. And of that, phosphate is the biggest concern with producers. The countervailing trade disputes with uh, Russia and Morocco. We still quite haven't figured out how to patch up those global trade flows. Um, and just last week, we saw China put a ban on their ex their phosphate and urea exports in order to ensure domestic availability over there. So it definitely puts a pinch on U.S. Uh, phosphate supplies and you know, farmers are really going to have to start making some critical decisions as spring pricing becomes available, whether or not they want to book supplies now and ensure that they can have them when they do want to uh, do applications, or if they want to take a gamble and wait to see if prices go down in the new year. All right, Ken, final thoughts from you? Well, we haven't talked about wheat, and it's it, you can hardly talk about two crops in isolation without talking about two or three other crops uh, that are going to affect the two crops that you're talking about. Uh, wheat globally is shaping up to be a very interesting situation over the next couple of months. Uh, I expect USDA to lower global wheat production significantly uh, in their August report and probably even lower it a bit more as they go forward, learning uh, what appears to be a very seriously affected uh, Canadian crop. We have a, a huge, a tight spot in uh, high protein milling quality wheat, uh, but that's going to keep wheat prices elevated, which in turn is going to keep wheat prices relative to corn prices elevated. It should ration some demand that otherwise 60 days ago, we've, we, we would have said there's going to be a lot of wheat fed in, in the globe. Uh, that's no longer probably going to be the case. Uh, so wheat prices are going to keep corn elevated. Uh, and I think given that winter wheat uh, planting season is probably about two months away, uh, it's going to affect some planting decisions for 2022 corn and soybean. So uh, keep your eye on wheat. Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting year in wheat that's going to maybe drive the other markets. Bring us on home, David. Well, this has been uh, super uh, educational for me. I feel like um, a lot of great uh, piece of advice to go think about. Um, one thing that I've been writing about and thinking about a lot is what's going on in China. And I think a lot of times it's easy for us to throw. It's easy for someone to stand up and say, oh, the data in China are junk for X, Y, and Z. And they never go look at the data. It's sort of like this excuse not to do the work. And so we've been looking at a lot of the data in China and looking at some of the trends and it's worth noting that, you know, why is China buying so much corn? Well, we have to dig into the data. And one of the things that jumped out to me is, you know, for the first part of for the last for the last 20 years, the first 15, China increased harvested acres of corn about every year. There was this nice trend. 
But over the last five years, China really hasn't added any corn acres. In fact, their corn harvested acres have been decreasing a slightly. And so when you combine China's consumption and and you combine this flat acreage story, this could be part of this buying spree that we saw in corn. So I just been thinking about China and the trends because China is one of those stories where um, some of the trends take years to sort of surface in the markets. And oftentimes we forget about some of those longer term trends, but we get super focused on, you know, the narrative of the last six or 12 months. And so that's part of what I've been thinking about a lot. Brent, I would just like to add, uh, if I could, I spent four years in China, so I have some appreciation for the data in China. But the one thing that I would say about China, keep in mind that they paid 40 some odd billion dollars for Syngenta several years ago. Uh, also, you may uh, be interested to know that they've had corn and biotechnology trials there since I was there in 2001 through 2004, have yet to commercialize them. So the one thing, and they're moving closer toward that. Uh, so the one thing I would keep an eye on is when they will uh, authorize biotechnology corn for production in China. That would add to their yields. So we appreciate that uh, addition here. That's a very important thought. And we hope that you've enjoyed this here at home. And uh, we invite you to come back next time here and join us on the Big Four as we address some of the key issues in the grain markets. In the meantime, you can check out Jacqueline's work at farmprogress.com. And you can follow Ken's insight at morrisononthemarkets.com. And you can also check out the award-winning work being done by David Widmar and you can, uh, Agricultural Economic Insights, co-founder Brent Gloy at AEI.ag. And don't forget to subscribe to the Inside Farm Life podcast, where each week I bring you ag industry newsmakers, hot button industry issues, educational features, and the best in true country music. And you can find that at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Deezer, Audible, and Odyssey. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Our panelists, Jacqueline Holland, Ken Morrison and David Widmar, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm Brent Adams, and we'll see you next time on The Big Four.